Sales Influence Podcast, where we talk about finding the why in how people buy. I'm your host, Victor Antonio. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for lending me your ears. And if you're watching us on a video platform, thank you for lending me those eyeballs. Today, I have Mr. Differentiation himself, Lee Sauce. What's happening, Lee? How are you doing today, Matt? Um, Victor, thanks so much for having me. Let's have some fun here, huh? I think we should, Matt. Let's talk sales and all things sales. But let them know a little bit about yourself. Who is... Maybe this is an existential question. Who is Lee Sauls? That's deep, man. I really want. That's a bad neighborhood, Victor. You really want to go there? <laughs> Let's go down that block. <laughs> <laughs> well, I am a sales management strategist. I help companies build the strategies, processes, and tools they need to win more deals at the prices they want. Man, that was that was Chris. You 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 must have rehearsed that a few times. I've done and, this once or twice, Victor. Yeah, and so. So I always like to get the background, like, you know, how, how'd you, you know, what was your first sales gig, man? What was your first sales gig? Think back. Okay, so I'm going to go way, way back. And actually, this is a story I tell in my in my new book, Sell Different, of it's, it's where I got the inspiration for sales differentiation. So I had a job as a teenager. So we had a family friend. I was in Marlboro, New Jersey, and this is 1986. Family friend came up with this revolutionary idea. Remember, 1986. This is not today. <laughs> and the idea was this. Pick up and delivery dry cleaning. He didn't own a dry cleaning, uh, a dry cleaners. But what he said was, you know, we, we're about an hour or so away from Manhattan, about an hour and a half from Philadelphia. So most of the people in Marlboro, New Jersey, New Jersey were, were commuting to New York City or, or to Philly. And this was still a time where people wore dress clothes to work. And the idea of finding time to go to a dry cleaner to take your stuff in and then finding time to pick it up, he said, you know, it's a hardship. So I've got this business idea where I'm going to contract with dry cleaners and I'm going to be the transportation. I'm going to pick up the dry cleaning. I'm going to bring it back to them. And then he paused and goes, well, actually, no, I'm not going to do it. You're going to do it. Mm -hmm. I was his driver. So that was uh, a, a job for me. And I was really intrigued because I said, okay, we're not offering a discount on the dry cleaning. This is a layer of cost on top of it. Would people be willing to pay for it? And I said, Victor, gosh, I, I hope they are because if this fails, I don't have a summer job anymore. And the answer was some people, not everyone. And it was such an important takeaway message that, that resonated with me. You see, if you had a way to get your clothes to the dry cleaner and pick it up, maybe you had someone at home or you weren't making that commute, you saw no value in that transportation service. But if you were a commuter, if you were one of the ones going to Manhattan or, or going to Philly, yeah. this was like, oh, my gosh, where have you been? And, and it really resonated. And so uh, it really spoke to me in, in, in a meaningful way, and, and it led to – this incubation of the idea around sales differentiation. And one of the key messages was know the audience. Not everybody is right for your product or service. So if you're always having this battle over price, maybe take a step back and say, maybe this isn't the right person in the right circumstance that values what you offer, values what you do. So uh, so that was one of the, the messages I came away with. But that was the, the beginning uh, of me looking at the, the world of sales differentiation. By the way, I mean, that's that's pretty amazing if you think about it. 86. Yeah. Like the, the internet hasn't really taken off yet. Do you know right. what I mean? And so yeah. to have that idea, I mean, they were like ahead of Uber. And I mean, it was like Uber Uber cleaners, right? You would have been Uber cleaners at the yeah. time or something like that. That's, that's amazing. That, that, uh, that, that is kind of amazing. By the way, don't you love resourceful people? They go, okay, there's a resource there. There's a resource there. I stick myself in the middle. Make this happen. And I yeah. love the fact that, you know, not everybody's for you. Some people who who value time will buy, will pay for it. And, it's, you know, oh. it's always interesting, isn't it, Lee? There's, I always tell people, somebody will buy it. Somebody will pay for it. Yeah. Just find that person. You know, as you were writing your book, Sales Differentiation, you know, what were some of the, like, uh, I like to ask this question because as an author as well, it's like you have it in your head. It all sounds yeah. right. But then yeah. when you write it and then you're like, then you have these aha moments like, Oh, yeah. OK. You know, did you have any of those? As you, First of all, tell us about the book and then talk to me about some maybe some moments of enlightenment that you had. Sure. So sales differentiation is all about the, the brand promise, if you will, that I mentioned earlier, helping you win more deals at the prices you want. And the book is broken into two parts, differentiating what you sell, because so often I find companies, they have differentiators. They know what they are 
but they can't get someone on the other side of the desk just as excited as they are about those differentiators. And Victor, you know, if you can't get someone just as excited as you are about those, you may as well not have them because only one conversation you're going to have, how cheap can I get it, right? right? Price, that's it. Then the other side of the equation is differentiating how you sell. Looking at every interaction, every touch point you have with a buyer and asking yourself this question, what is it that I can do different than the competition that my buyers will find meaningful? So it's not different for the sake of different. It's looking at every interaction and say, what can I do different than my competitors that my buyers would find meaningful? So those are the two halves of the book sales differentiation. And I, I, I am a, a perfectionist when it comes to, to writing a book. So what I did was to, to your question about the aha moments that I had, um, I had an editing team. I had four clients. I had two subject matter expert editors, my wife and my mother. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, let me give you a little background here. My mother is retired, but she was an educational evaluator in the New York City school system. So when I'd say something like, yeah, me and Brian are going to get pizza, she'd say, no, Brian and I. And i say, no, 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 Mom, you're not going. <laughs> she didn't find that funny, I'm sure. She did not find that funny. Um, but she and my wife, you know, you ask people for feedback on, on what you've written, and everyone thinks, you know, they're telling you your baby's ugly. And, and my thing is, I want to take my beatings now. I don't want it on Amazon and someone says, this is junk. Did anybody even look through this? Now, my wife has no problem saying, I don't know what it is you're trying to say here, but I don't get it. And it irritates me when she says it, but she's right 100% of the time. By the way, by the way, do you do, you do that thing where you look at her? Because I do this. My wife gives me feedback, and I'm like, you look at her with that, 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 that distant stare like, okay, you, you, you may be right. And I don't want to admit it at the moment. I don't know about you. I don't want to admit it in the moment. Well, let, let me look at it again then. Let me make sure. But then you walk away going, Damn it, I think she's right. Damn yep. it, I think she's right. See, I, I've are. mastered I've mastered the eye roll. See, she says, I go, oh. But she's <laughs> right every single time. I go back and I read and go, oh, man. Yeah. I know. I find, you know, it's funny because you, as, as, you just got to stuff your ego in your back pocket. It is hard, man. It's hard because, like, they're calling your baby ugly. Uh, you, mm -hmm. After a while, you have to kind of detach yourself. They're, they're criticizing the book. Not so much you. And yes. so as you were going through the book, like what were some of the aha moments? Like you said, man, okay, I didn't see that one. I didn't really think about that, but that's cool. Yeah, um, it was on the uh, differentiating the what you sell side of the equation. And, and my wife really brought this out because I have a whole methodology to do it, you know, step by step. And she says to me, this seems really complex and, and overwhelming for people. So can, <laughs> can you break it down into chunks? And, I, and I've been doing consulting and workshops on this for 20-something years, you know, so I'm like, complex? Really? Yeah. By the way, yeah. Is, your, is your wife also from Minnesota? No. No. She's from New, New Nor York. am I. I'm an East Coast person. I grew up in New York City, New Jersey. She grew up grew up in New York and Florida, but she has the New York City, uh, New York personality, and of course, my, my mother in New York City and New Jersey. So, yeah, so they, they've got the... the uh, We'll call it strong women in my family. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but um, but she challenged me to really break it into into chunks, easily digestible chunks that the reader can then walk through uh, and, and implement. And that was one of the things that was really important to me, that if you read sales differentiation, that it wasn't just a, oh, that was an interesting read, that you could actually dog ear it and actually go step by step and implement it and be able to use it in, in your business. And I've gotten so many emails, and it, it's it's so touching. I'm sure you enjoy this as mm -hmm. well. When you get emails from readers who say, I put your what you told me to do, I put it into mm -hmm. practice, and the results have been just magical. That's that's the beauty that people don't see unless you write oh, the book. Absolutely. Makes it all worthwhile. The one part, you know, it's funny because, you know, you and I read a lot of sales books, right? We do. And, yeah. And, and so when people give me a sales book to read, you know, I'm not saying I do an eye roll. But I go, man, it better be good. Yeah, because yeah. I've read a lot of stuff. It better be good. Yeah. And so I was going through your book, and the part that just, like, brilliant. I was like, I had this, okay, least brilliant moment. That's my least okay, brilliant moment. Okay, now wait for it. I can't imagine which one it is, but go ahead. Uh, it's the one that starts on page 34, which is uh, it's talk, you talk about the sales differentiation universe. Yes. And I, and I remember I looked at it, I go, what? 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 
And then I read it. So I read through it and then I go, okay, so the company, I'm looking at it right now, the people, you got to look at the contract. Oh, I skipped a couple, sorry. And then you look, uh, the products, the service Product, technology. Service. Yeah. And so I go, what, what is that? Then I go back and read it again. Like, oh, wait a minute. I think I read that too fast because sometimes that's your habit, right? You just shoot through mm -hmm. it. And yeah. I go, and then, so for those of you who are listening, let me just explain. There are six components to the sales differentiation universe. And what we're trying to do is trying to find ways to differentiate. And if you ask people, how do you differentiate your product? They may come up with three to five, maybe different ways of doing it. Right. Maybe more. I'll be generous. Seven. Right. Mm -hmm. But then you break it down. First of all, you create six what I call mega categories. Right. Right. And then within this mega category, one being the company, well, how can mm -hmm. you differentiate your company? Then you got about a quick glance says I got about 10 to 15 ways mm -hmm. you can differentiate. Then you say the people and you got another 10 to 15, maybe more. Then you look at, for example, the product. That's the one everybody guesses. But even now, even in that one, you had a few more. Yeah. Service, I never looked at that. Oh, yeah, you can differentiate service. How do we articulate that? Tech so just those six categories. I was like, there's mm -hmm. so much like gold to mine in terms of differentiation, if you just, I mean, that's four pages out of the whole book. I don't even care if you read the whole book. You know, I want you to read it. But if, to me, that was like, just read that part right there. That part, because it's almost like a, it's almost like a template, six mm -hmm. categories for you to differentiate your product. Tell me how that came about. Because I mean, that's pretty creative. Oh, I've well, never looked you. at it that way. I never looked at it that way. So there, there's a three-step process I go through with clients, and I describe it in the book to help you find what your differentiators are. So the first one's a competitor analysis. So you pick the competitors you go up against most often, and you ask yourself two questions. Why do you win? Why do they win? But price can't be on either side of the ledger for all the reasons you all know, right? I mean, people don't buy based on price. They buy based on value. They may tell you it's price, but it's because you haven't demonstrated meaningful value. But why you win, why they win, and you take price off the table. Then you do a, another analysis around decision influencers. Those are the people who affect the decision to buy what you sell. And again, two sides of a ledger. What's keeping them up at night? What are their goals? What are they trying to accomplish? What are their concerns? Have that on one side. And then on the right side, how can you help address those? Now, there will be some on that list that you can't help with, so just skip those. But the ones that you can, I, I call it the synergy side. Here's what their concern is, and here's how we can help. So if you take those two exercises, if you take the why you win side from the competitor analysis, and you take the synergy side from the decision influencer analysis, that gives you a laundry list of differentiators. Then the third step is to get into the sales differentiation universe. This is your catch-all, if you will. And Victor, as you talked about, these different categories where your differentiators may be hiding. So I did this workshop program with a client. They're, they're in the middle of it right now. They're in a, uh, a door manufacturer, like for, for high-end homes. And they went through those three steps. Victor, they had 230 differentiators on their list. Wow. Wow. And, and it was funny. Doors, so, by the way. Doors. Manufacturing doors. That's it. By the way. Exterior I just, I just, doors. I just want to pause here. For those of you who say you can't differentiate your product, Lee just came, talked, consulted with a company who came up with 230 ways to differentiate a door. Right. That's right. right. <laughs> just, and, then, and then what we do, and you can't work with 230. That's not meaningful. So the next step, and this is what they're doing right now, is a grouping exercise. When you read through them, you find themes. Say, well, this is all around uh, the manufacturing process, or this is really around uh, our delivery, or this is uh, really around our service. So you start grouping them in a meaningful way. And once you've done that, then you're ready to start having a conversation around positioning that differentiator. And, and there's a five-step process that you go go through and, with that. And, and, and I love that because once you begin to group them, as you say, the different themes, right? But yep. that also becomes part of your presentation, your messaging as well, as you're having those conversations, you're telling your story. But, you know, how did you come up with, you know, like, how did you come up with this, man? I mean, that's a simple question to ask is like, how did you come up with this? Because this, it sounds simple, but I know that going through that process and coming out the other side with this, you know, this sales universe was like, Okay, how did he come up with that? Yeah, um, it was an evolution. So um, 
differentiation has been a passion of mine, like I said, back to when I was a teenager. When I ran sales organizations, it was something that I, I always uh, took on and figure out how we differentiate what we're selling and how we're selling. And it, and it really was an evolution. So it started with a master list of, of differentiators and all these different possibilities. And it kept growing and growing and growing. And then I said, okay, this is unmanageable. And let's group them in a meaningful way. Well, these are really attributes of the company. These are really attributes of the people and of the product, of the service, of the technology. And, and it's interesting. Um, we don't think about the contract one enough, that, that particular sphere there. Um, like I have a client, they're in the garbage business, you know, in, in Minnesota, as you know, because you lived here. In, in most of the counties here, every homeowner and every business contracts for their own trash removal. Now, think about that. So on Wednesday morning, so today, coincidentally, is Wednesday, there was a parade of garbage trucks coming down my street representing every hauler that you can name. And, and they fundamentally need to differentiate themselves because they have to sell their services home by home, business by business. So um, this one client of mine who reached out to me, uh, CEO said, boy, I, I believe we're providing meaningful value. I believe that we're different. And I, I didn't buy it because I watch every every Wednesday morning. They're doing the same thing. Truck shows up, grabs a can, lifts it up, dumps the contents in the truck. Truck pulls away and you, you get an invoice at the end of the month. But he was right. They had a lot of differentiators. And one of them, in his cases, they don't have a contract. They said, we're going to earn their business each and every day. Every other hauler has a contract like the old health club contracts, where as soon as you sign it, <laughs> you stop paying, you're going to court. I mean, th those aggressive contracts with uh, auto renews that if you don't cancel in like this five day window at the end of the year, it auto renews for another year and you can't get out of it again. Yeah. I, by the way, I love that. They, my, my differentiators, I had to have a contract. <laughs> right. I love that. And and right. so they get to have that con that conversation where <clears throat> anybody that's been in, in this relationship with, with a uh, – with a garbage hauler and they couldn't get out of the agreement and they weren't happy with it. And they say, you know what? We're, we're going to, we're happy to earn your business every day. We don't need to have a contract. If you're not happy with us, you can leave anytime you want. And, and we don't think about that. Um, or the warranties that, that you have or, or the various other provisions. We don't think about that. When you look at that cradle to grave of opportunities that you have to differentiate that contract phase, how it's memorialized that that's significant. And, and within that, you say, how do you convey your, your solution? So I worked in an, in an industry, in the employment screening industry, um, drug testing, background screening. And what some of our competitors would do is they basically send out a menu. Here's all the different background checks and drug tests you could possibly do. And it, and it all looked vanilla. They all looked the same. So we said, that's not really helpful to them. So let's really define what's happening in each of these and build not a proposal, but a statement of work so that they could hold something in their hands and they say, I know exactly I'm getting what I'm getting for the dollars that I'm investing. And it was so refreshing because it took, it's, we said, let's let them do the marketing stuff and, and do that and how they want to communicate a solution. We're going to be really specific so that when they read this, there's no pictures and we tell them up front. Um, the next step of our process is we're going to put together a statement of work. Now, you'll notice it's not colorful. There's no photos in it. What it is, the document that says, I know what I'm getting for the dollars I'm investing with these guys. And it, it, it was amazing, the, the reaction to it, because there was sick and tired of just getting a 46-page document that half a page actually was meaningful to them, which was, here's the price. <laughs> The rest of it was just generic. And so we just tailored it. So that's an example of when you talk about differentiating how you sell, we looked at that step of the process and we said, what can we do different that our buyers would find meaningful? And it worked tremendously well. That, and that's what I liked about this part. I mean, the book itself is great. But what I loved about this was that it, it was so actionable. And it, it, I mentally see people getting unstuck. And so I just want to highlight this one more time for the listeners. So what he did was, what Lee did was, he broke, a, he created six categories. One is, look at your company, and then he has, uh, again, about 10 to 15 ways you can differentiate your company. Then he went to people, and th again, another 10 to 15. Then you get to contract, I'm his product. Hold on, my pages are sticking here. So the second, uh, third, let me see, so we got the company, the people, the products, the service, the technology, and then the contract. The contract right. one really blew me away. 
at the yeah. end, I go the contract. I never, I never looked at a contract, and you just gave two examples as a differentiator. And here you have about ten ways you could probably do it. And yeah. so, so just correct me if I'm wrong here, but a good way to approach this is that if you're struggling with getting your differentiators, I guess documented, this would be a great place to start, at least to give you ideas. I saw this as a, you did all the brainstorming for me. Now I get to mm -hmm. cherry pick what I can use. Yeah, so you can take the, like I said, do the competitor analysis, do the decision influencer analysis, then you get into that sales differentiation universe, and then you you go, wow, we've got a lot to talk about. So none of that addressed how to do it. That was just figuring out what's the conversation we need to be having. I love that. So how did you get, well, here, let me ask this question. And, and this is, it, it's going to sound like a corny question, but it's, there's, there's a seriousness behind this. Okay. I, I like to ask people, you know, what, what, what is their sales superpower? But let me explain what that means. You know, there, there's something that each of us in sales, we do well. You know, we do, we do certain things. It could be one, maybe two things well yeah. that yeah. really allow us to become successful. It's almost like the 80-20. Just those things I do really encompass 80% of my success. What would that be for you? Um, asking questions that help people think differently about the solution they have or could have. And that's what I teach other salespeople and, and client organizations to do. So one of the phone calls and emails that, that I get is, we need sales training. I want to talk to you about sales training. And of course, their expectation is, I'm going to say, sure, let's talk about all the different sales training. And what they get back from me are a couple of questions. One is, why do you think you need sales training? What, what are you hoping that that I'm going to be able to do? Because I don't have a magical power, right? I might, I'll come in a few hours a day, whatever it is, but I'm going to go away. So what do you think that sales training is going to do? And, and what ultimately happens in those cases, we it turns out they don't have a sales training problem. That's a symptom of the real problem, which is they don't have a sales process. They don't have a methodology in place. And that becomes the real the real conversation for us to have. But asking those thoughtful, insightful questions, because no one likes to be lectured. It's it's the worst thing, right? Salespeople think that if you have the gift of gab, if you're a really good talker, you should be in sales. And the sales management profession preaches listening skills and says, boy, most critical sales skill is listening. And I differ with both. I differ with salespeople and sales managers. I say the most critical skill to master is asking thoughtful, insightful questions. Here's why. You ask a thoughtful, insightful question, then there's something meaningful to listen to, and then you can share information appropriately. It starts with the questions. I love, and, by the way, I, I, I apologize. Yeah. I just love what you just said. If I ask a meaningful question, I'm going to get an answer that actually might be a joy to listen to, like mm -hmm. something I'll get back. That's my reward for coming up with a great question. I never looked at it that way. It's a great way of putting it. And then you think in your head, you've got this big mm. database of information that you could be talking about. You could probably talk about your company for 16 hours. No one's giving you a 16 hour meeting. But based on what you've heard, now you can filter in that database, pick out, ah, these are the nuggets that I should share in this circumstance. I love that. I, I, I interviewed uh, Brent Adamson, uh, the, one of the authors of the uh, Challenger Sale. Yeah. And so, you know, he's got this new, um, it's a white paper now on Gartner about sense making. I don't know if you read it or got a chance to I haven't at least seen that yet. And so basically, they looked at three types of salespeople, giving you the short footnote version of this thumbnail yeah. version, which yeah. is they, they looked at the tellers, the sellers. Let me see. The, yeah, it was the tellers. Okay. You tell somebody, here's what you do, or you give them, or the giver, you give them more information. And in both cases, they failed against the sense maker. And the sense maker was a person who really listens, asks the right questions, and then helps the customer make sense out of what they have in front of them because there's so many options in this world, you know, yeah. when it comes to buying something. But but, but I think you, when you're telling me that, that the superpower is asking qualified questions. So when, you know, <clears throat> when you're going to talk to a customer, I know you have your pat questions that you've built, like a little mm -hmm. database you've built. Yeah. But if you're starting out and just, this is a person who's only in sales one to two years is struggling right now. Mm -hmm. You know, how do you help them build, you know, that, that superpower, that, that, that asking thoughtful question superpower? Yeah. So if you think of it in the big bucket, I call it the art of query. Mm -hmm. And, and I break it down and this is in my new book, sell different, um, and this is not an infomercial because you can't buy it yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. I talk about horizontal and vertical questions, and, and I'm going to make you really hurt for a moment. You know the last time you went to the dentist, you got a cleaning, and then you had a dental exam. 
And the dentist pulls out this big metal hook, right? Don't put any metal in your mouth except if you're a dentist. And it's about this big. And what do they do? They go tooth by tooth looking for that hook to stick. Mm -hmm. And as soon as that that, that hook sticks in a tooth, they set up camp right there and they get a complete picture of what's going on with that tooth. God, so you're bringing back to, bad memories, man. And that hurt. Doesn't that hurt? <laughs> it does. I, I actually felt the pick in my mouth already. <laughs> <laughs> so think of that from a discovery, from a questioning perspective, right? The horizontal questions are that hook going tooth by tooth just to see if there's something there. The vertical questions is when we get a piece of information, when the hook sticks a little bit, we need to get a complete picture of what's going on. And, and so if you're new to sales, if you're a veteran, this is something that, uh, that we don't have enough mastery of in, in sales, of setting up camp and getting a, a complete picture. And, and so I, I do a lot of work with salespeople reprogramming them. Why am I reprogramming them, Victor? Because we all come into this world naturally inquisitive. Little kids, right? The best salespeople from a questioning perspective, why is the sky blue? Why is this so big? Why is this so round? And what do parents do? No more questions, right? We quell it. Right, just because. So we condition children not to ask questions. But if you agree with my premise that we've got to be asking thoughtful, insightful questions, we got to reprogram ourselves. So there's an exercise, <coughs> excuse me, that I do with salespeople. And I say, I'm, I want you to forget about what you're selling for a moment. I'm going to give you a data point. And I want you to come up with as many questions as you can based on that data point. So I'll give you one. I'll say, I want to go to Florida. Come up with as many questions. These are the vertical questions you can come up with based on that one data point. Okay. What so part I, of Florida? And, and, and is, and yeah, what well, part of Florida? Have you uh, been when? there before? What do you like to do? Where do you want to stay? Do you like uh, the ocean or are you looking for more pool environment? The record I have is, uh, I, so I just with a client organization, uh, and they all came up with their questions, 86 questions based on that one data point. Mm. Wow. And, and and the reason we do that is, we're so, when we think about in discovery, we ask a question, we listen to the response, and we write it down. So what CRM are you using? Oh, I'm using Salesforce. Okay, I write down Salesforce, and I move on to the next question. Well, if that affects my sale, so how long have you been using Salesforce? How did you select them from all the CRMs? I, I, I just got I just got to slow you down because this is like yeah. so good. I've never heard anybody describe it this way. So I'm like a little I'm, I get giddy when I hear cool things like this. Okay, because it's a good way of learning. Right? I've never looked at that. If you take a data point, then you build the questions around that data point and just freestyle, so to speak, yes. brainstorm and come That's up as right. many. And right. then I love I love the way you tied now to Salesforce instead of just yeah oh you use a Salesforce got it as your CRM. But now from there, and I didn't mean to interrupt, but it's just such a no, heavy point that you start really building those questions. And then yeah. so I built this list of 86 questions or whatever that company has, yeah. whatever the record. Right. You know, yep. th- what would be the next step, Lee? Okay. So <clears throat> this is condition. You're doing this outside the game. This is not, you know, with a client saying, let me come up with all these questions. Yeah, <laughs> let's clarify right? that. Yeah, let's clarify. Yes, that. yes. Let be really clear here. But the idea of being naturally inquisitive, I need you to go back to your roots when you first came into this world and go back to being naturally inquisitive. And if you use that as your guide, if you're new to sales, you're saying, I'm not really sure how to uh, have the right conversations. And you say, you know, when I learn a piece of information, I'm constantly on this quest of understanding the why, not just a data point, the big picture, the comprehensive picture behind it. If you do that, you'll acquire the information you need to ultimately come up with the right solutions for the opportunity. Yeah, I, I'm trying to figure out, you know, when you do this and you're talking to a, I mean, you want to do it before you go in to see a client, right? Right. So I would get together, I'm just hypothetically doing a hypothetical right here, and you tell yeah. me where I, I'm off rails. Okay. But I, w- I would sit there with my team and say, all right, look, these are the things that usually come up. These are the things the customer's typically going to say. All right, yep. let's take that one right there and let's drill down on that one. And then we we triage, we vet the best of the best questions that obviously help them guide them towards our solution, if I can put it that way. Right. So so there, there's two pieces. One is is retraining your brain to, to think in this way. So what I'll do is I'll work with sales managers and I'll give them these scenarios. I'll start with the generic ones like I want to go to Florida and then we'll get specific to their world and challenge the salespeople. So what we do is we'll say, I'm going to give you three minutes. I'm going to give you a data point. 
and you write down as many questions you can come up with based on that one data point. And that, when I mentioned about the 86, that was giving them a three minute window to come up with as many questions as they could. Wow. Wow. So, and, so and give, me an give me an example of a company. You don't have to yep. give me the company name, but just whatever yeah. product or service they sell. And then say, here was the data point. Yep. Okay. Uh, let's see. So, okay. So this is a company that sells uh, technology to manage your, your accounting function. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the question, one of the questions is, how do you um, manage your accounting today? And they might hear we use QuickBooks or we do it in Excel spreadsheets, something like that. And what would happen to sales, we just write down QuickBooks or Excel spreadsheet and move on to the next question. As opposed to, okay, you just got a nice piece of information. They told you uh, I'm using QuickBooks. Well, great. How, how long have you been using QuickBooks? How did you select QuickBooks? What, what do you love about QuickBooks? What's something you'd like to change? I mean, so that one data point can mushroom into all these different conversations. But what happens so often, because we've been conditioned not to ask a lot of questions, we just write down the data point and we move on to the next one. And, and, and sales managers, they, haven't, they don't describe it the way I am, but they know this is an issue. Because what happens is the salesperson comes back and they say, oh, I just had a great meeting with Phil Jones at the ABC company. And the sales manager starts to ask these questions. What, what, what technology are they using today? Oh, they're using QuickBooks. How come they're using QuickBooks? How long have they been using QuickBooks? Why are they looking to make a change from QuickBooks? And the sales rep goes, oh, crud. I thought I had a great meeting. <laughs> but no, no. I, I, you know, by the way. That's you know, what happens. One of the, and, I, and I want to thank you, Lee, because one of the joys I love about doing these interviews, I walk away learning something new or at least a new strategy, new approach. And, and I love this one because – it, you do have to like deprogram yourself, right? You, you know, uh, I was talking to Mark Hunter, you know him well, oh, and course. we were talking about how, uh, how we have to deprogram our brain. Like, you know, in selling, we got to ask questions. People say, don't, don't ask so many questions. And by right. the way, don't interrupt people when they're talking. Well, that's sales. We interrupt people all the time. Don't talk to strangers. <laughs> oh God, got to do that if I want to sell something. And so there is that deep program. You made me laugh because there's that deep programming that goes on. But, but I think this is another like actual tactical thing. That's something you can do. And like your Absolutely. example with, with QuickBooks is like, just that simple example, why QuickBooks? When did you choose it? How did you make that buying decision? What do you like? What do you don't like? What would you like to see in your next order you know, package, whatever it may be? And then from there, you start vetting the best of the best questions, and then that's how you build your database. I love that. Love that and strategy. Victor, I, don't, I don't know if you have a way uh, to put an attachment in with, with this interview, but I've got a one-pager around this concept of horizontal and vertical questions that I can send to you, and then if you want to share it with the, this interview – that yeah, might help what I'll, what I'll do it, I'll put, is I'll send it to me. I'll put it in the okay. show notes. Uh, and by the way, if you have a link, that's even better uh, to your okay. website. Maybe they can go to your website and just download it. So I'll just send okay. it your – do it that way. It's easier that way. Is that easier? Okay. We yeah. Can do that. Plus, so be, plus, they can check out you know your book, your upcoming book, and the great content you have on the website. So let's do, do that. that. Hey, so you know, shifting topics a little bit, slightly mm – -hmm. The, you know, we're, we're in this virtual selling world now, right? Yes. Virtual selling world. How is that? Now we're looking at sales differentiation, your book. Now we're looking at the virtual selling. You know where I'm going with this one. I do. Right. Let, 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 let's stir the pot, man. How do I do it virtually? <laughs> <laughs> so so when, I, when I signed my deal with HarperCollins for my new book, Sell Different. By the way, congratulations, and, and, man. Thank you. Thank That's you. Awesome. There, That's awesome. there was not a chapter on virtual selling, but guess what? There is now. <laughs> There has to be. And by the way, any sales book that doesn't have some type of virtual selling, remote selling type of, you know, content, uh, you're, you're missing out. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and again, there are opportunities to be different. There are meaningful ways um, that you can use virtual selling to stand out from the competition. Mm -hmm. That is a differentiator. So it can be. Uh, I'll give you one little nugget. Hmm. It's so simple and nobody does it. You know, so you go to, let's say, a Zoom call, right? And uh, you, you put in your, your – it's like a nuclear sub-launch thing, right? You put in this 15,000-digit code to ultimately get in the room, and you're still not exactly sure if you're in the right place. Mm -hmm. What if you had a welcome screen? So when the prospect comes in, they see their logo, and they see the, uh, the agenda for the meeting. So, oh, I'm in the right place, yep. right? And it's welcoming. It's personalized. And you set the tone – Right. I mean, before you even get on, you set the tone with them. Hey, they're going to they really care about each individual as opposed to it's just another sale. Yeah. 
Yeah. And by the way, all these, you know, what you just highlighted is a new strategy that you had to come up with given the new conditions we're living under, right? Right. And I think what's going to happen if we fast forward three to five years, we're going to discover all these little things we can do to make a virtual call that much more effective. Absolutely. And so, you know, like I, I had a chance to interview the guy, Dave Shaby, who wrote Virtual Selling, the other virtual selling from Jeb Blunt. Okay, uh, yeah. And the, the conversations were interesting because, you know, from his perspective, a lot of, and I'd love to get your take on this, a lot of buyers are now doing their own customer journey, right? We all know this, right? And they're all, sure. but one of the stats that I found astounding, and I want to get your opinion on this one. He said, ninety-two percent of potential buyers, if you as a salesperson reach out to a buyer, ninety-two percent will look at your LinkedIn profile. And I was like, ninety-two, not not sixty, not sixty-five, ninety-two percent. And mm -hmm. how how do you use social media and maybe even specifically LinkedIn? Yep. to differentiate yourself in the market? Uh, great question. So um, LinkedIn is extremely important. I don't know if the percentage is that high. I mean, if he's got a study to support it, then then that's certainly what that reveals. Mm. Um, but when I work with clients around business development, I tell them all roads lead back to LinkedIn. Like if you're going to share information, if you're going to engage in discussions, someone's intrigued, they're going to click on that link and they're going to come to your profile page and you better be telling the story that you want to tell that's going to create that intrigue. And so, for example, if you love fishing, if you're a fisherman and you got a really big fish, that's your Facebook picture, not your LinkedIn picture. You'd be amazed. I, I work with clients on using LinkedIn for recruiting. And I thought that that was something that was understood a long time ago. I cannot believe the family pictures and the, and the fish and the hunting. And uh, that's not oh. LinkedIn conservative no. professional business photo my i, li I like the uh what, what were those uh remember there used to be like a lot of boutique places stores where you go take these fashion photos you know you're on the rug all <laughs> provocative looking you know I'm like you that's gotta, not the, gotta photo. Have the hand on the chin right <laughs> hand on the chin you know or you know you're doing this i know you guys can't see this unless you're watching this on video it's funny you should check out the video if you're on the podcast but I see these things and I'm going, okay, that's, that's not good. That picture is not good, but it's yes. always interesting how, you know, we're going to come up with, so even our LinkedIn, you know, but how are you differentiating yourself in the market today, Lee? Cause again, there's a lot of yeah. noise out there, a there lot is. of noise. Yep. So you have to decide how you want to use LinkedIn. And, and for a lot of people, it's cloudy. First of all, if you're using LinkedIn for business development purposes, there is no law, at least I don't think there is, there is no law that says every job you've ever had. So when you were a bartender or a bouncer or whatever it was, has to be listed in your LinkedIn profile. There's no law that says that. So if you want to be perceived as having an expertise in a particular aspect, only list those roles relevant to that expertise. Mm -hmm. that, that's super important. And then when you're on the platform, you know, one of the beauties of social media is you can be seen as an expert in 30 days. So let's say, Victor, you and I decide we want to be seen as experts in babysitting. We don't have to write a blog. We don't have to create a single video. All we have to do is share information about babysitting all the time. And in 30 days, the world will see us as experts in babysitting. That's, that's the core premise. So when you say, how do I want to be perceived on LinkedIn? Well, you look at the solutions that your company offers and, and you say, I want to be seen as an expert in solving these issues for clients. Great. You don't have to write a blog. You don't have to create a video. Hmm. All you have to do is share information that is going to be seen by people around that area of expertise. By the way, I hope that's not a deal you're missing in the background just for me. I apologize. Let me, I thought no. this was disconnected. Hang on. Don't worry about it. That was that was a million dollar Lee. For those of you who are listening, Lee is now yes. shutting down a million dollar deals just to talk I to did. Mr. Antonio. Just to there talk you to you, I apologize. I thought that was disconnected. <laughs> no worries. the The thing is, I'm starting to see that also that that one of the things that salespeople can do, you know, is brand themselves as an expert in their field. And when yes. I tell people this, immediately the salesperson goes, "You mean I should talk about my product?" No. It should lead to your product, but you really want to position yourself as an expert. You know, you know, add some layers to that one, Lee. Yeah. So if you let's say you're in the car business, right? Let's say new cars and you want to be seen as an expert in the new car space. So you might share information about gas prices. Why? Because when gas prices go up, people look for more efficient vehicles. Gas prices come down they're They're more flexible in the options. 
So gas prices or, or oil prices might be ones to, to share. New technologies in, in the world of cars. Um, new studies on, on braking systems or mm-hmm. a court case of, around uh, something that took place. But everything around the automotive space so that when I say, boy, I need to get a car, mm-hmm. talk to Lee. Because he has that expertise. But I have a, yeah. I was going to say, they could use your same method. You know, when you talk about the data point, it's yeah. almost the same method, right? Here's a data point. I'm in the car business. That's now, it. what, and we'll just say, list out 52, one per week, things that you can talk about every week that yep. has to do with the car business to That's make right. you look like an expert. I didn't Correct. mean to interrupt, but go ahead. You were going to say something. No, you're right. And I mean, I'll give you an example. So um, there's someone where, where I live, he's a realtor. And, and so he took a step back and he said, you know, there's a lot of realtors. I can't say I'm the best realtor. Can't prove it. Every every realtor has these – is in the million-dollar club, right? So you can't use that as a benchmark because, you know, if you look at the price of a home, you sell two homes, you're in the million dollars. Um, but he said, how can I – how can I be different? And, and one of the things that he and I talked about that he's put into practice is he put together a list of contractors for homes. And it's it, – his name – recommends so you're a homeowner and you say boy I'm, I'm looking for someone that can build a deck or take care of my lawn or electrician you call him he demonstrates an expertise in the home and when you think of boy who should i call i'm thinking about selling my home or i want to buy another home whatever that is boom his name is first to to come to mind and oh by Brilliant. the way you wind up on his list and so you hear from him periodically too I love that. It's something that simple. And I, I think it it's a great tool today to use. So when somebody, if that, if we believe that 92%, the first thing I do is I look at activity. Yep. When I look at a profile, I read the profile. And like you said, if you, if you were washing dishes 30 years ago, no need to put that on the resume, so to speak, <laughs> right? Take, take it out. But the other thing is I look at their activities, what they've posted. And so then I go through that, and that's actually how I find a lot of my guests for the Sales Influence Podcast, because oh, I go through activities, and they're like, oh, that's interesting. That's, uh, I didn't look at that. That was interesting. And yeah. so, I mean, all of that matters. And so, but isn't that, isn't that a different way of, of selling in today's market? I mean, you know, back in the day, we didn't have to worry about branding ourselves. Mm-hmm. Now they have to worry about branding themselves. They do. Um, and that is definitely, I don't know if I call it a difference. I look at it more as an opportunity, because you couldn't do this before. Now that you have social media, you can be seen however you want to be seen, but we don't think enough about that opportunity that we have and say, how do I want to be seen on LinkedIn? There are still a lot of people out there that believe LinkedIn's a waste of time or it's just a place to find a job, which is, it's not wrong, it's just limited. Yes, you can find a job that way. Um, and I'm not suggesting, nor are you, that you spend 24 hours a day on LinkedIn and that's all that you do, but it's a tool that can help attract people to you. On a regular basis, I have companies, uh, executives reach out to me and say, hey, I read your post on, on LinkedIn. We seem to have that issue. I'd like to talk to you about that. And wouldn't it be great if you had prospects calling you instead of you having to track them down? And, and that's what LinkedIn can do for you. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm doing a quick recap of what you've said so far about differentiation, staying on the topic of differentiation. So yeah. one, you know, you, you wrote the book on differentiation. That's an easy one. Uh, but also you said use questions to differentiate yourself, the types of questions, right. the quality questions. And when we talk about LinkedIn, I just want to do a re- uh, recap is that you can use it as a differentiator, you know, especially on the content that you put out there. So it's, again, you can focus on differentiating your product, but you're also talking about how do I differentiate myself from mm-hmm. the noise out there? You know, Absolutely. what other differentiation strategies do you use that you can think of off the top of your head? I'm putting you on a spot, by the way. Uh, on LinkedIn or in general? In general. Okay. So let's talk about the, the how you sell side because, mm-hmm. you know, you look at what you sell, product, service, technology, whatever it is, you, you, hit a, you hit a wall at some point. You can only differentiate it so far. But look at the how you sell side. So, for example, prospecting. First of all, every salesperson hates it. Call it cold, cold, call whatever you want to call it. And there's someone that hates it more than you do. And it's the person on the other end of the phone getting this call that knows that you're only calling for one reason, to sell them something that they don't want, they don't need, so you can get a commission check. So there's this concept in, in, in the book called the sales crime theory. And it's based on this. Imagine, oh, by the way, yeah. I love the title already. Very dramatic. Very yeah. dramatic. Da, da, da. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
my favorite TV show is the original Law and Order. If that gives you any any idea <laughs> why why it'd be called the Sales Crime Theory, but imagine it's two in the morning, and there's a pounding on your front door. It's the police. They want to talk with you about a crime that's recently been committed. Now they don't randomly pick you and your home for this conversation. They've analyzed the evidence, put together a crime theory, which has led them to you for a conversation right now. So you can see where we're going, Victor, right? Mm -hmm. The sales Mm -hmm. crime theory is the same concept. We don't pick up the phone. We don't send an email until we figure out why they should want to have a conversation with us right now. So I, I have this client. They sell technology for conference rooms. And so we said, what is the evidence that if we came across it, would tell us that they should want to have a conversation with us right now. So technology and conference rooms. So if there's an acquisition, a relocation, a new CIO, there's probably a conversation going on about the technology in the conference rooms. And since that's what we do, they should want to have a conversation with us right now. Mm Mm-hmm. So, so that's a nugget that you can put into practice right away. Well, well I love that. But it, it, let's put a let's put, let's put a tie the button down on that one, so to speak. The, let's do it. You, there, you have a product or service. You want to find people who are going to need it, right? So, in a sense, you talked about like triggers, right? If they move, they relocate. Uh, I don't know. Have to move to the yeah. offices, whatever it may be. Yeah. And then you know what that is, and so you know what those triggers are. But you can also, you know, uh, add just a little flavor. Is you can probably develop content. That's right around those issues, those triggers that yep. they will find on their, people will find on their journey and said, oh, by the way, these guys seem to be help when you have to relocate and you need to install an infrastructure, IT, whatever, you know, add something to that. Yeah, so I, I did that uh, on a consulting basis for a, a client. The company sells technology into retail, uh, the, the brick and mortar. And so what we did was we looked at each of those evidence types and we said, okay, if this is going on, These are the questions we should be asking. This is the information we should share that gets us in the door so that we can have meaningful conversations. You don't need me to do that. You can do that on your own. So you look at, take the conference room example. If there's a relocation, then what are the message points? What's the target point of entry? Who are you going to reach out to in that organization? If there's a relocation to talk about the technology in the conference room, What are the key message points you're going to convey to get to the next step, which is a full discovery meeting? Yeah, I'm only going to disagree with you on one point that they don't need to contact you. I'm going to say they do need to contact because some people (laughs) need help with that. Right. We we, we, for us, it may be second nature, but a lot of people. Well, how do I do that? What are the questions? Okay, if I do the entry point, how do I do the presentation? How do I sequence my presentation? How do I do? So they need folks like you to help them differentiate. Lee Uh, Salt. Well, you're very kind. Thank you. No, no, no. Well deserved, Matt. So let them know, Lee, where they can find more information about you. Uh, My website is Sales Architects. A R C H I T E C T S. Don't forget it's plural. Dot com. And they can find you on LinkedIn. Just look for Lee Salz. I'm on S-A-L-Z. LinkedIn as well, of course. You, you yeah. can track them down. And again, the book today is Sales Differentiation. The book co- upcoming is? Sell well, Different. Sell Different, man. That's, uh, they're looking forward to it, Matt. Do I get an advanced copy of that or something like that? Maybe? Absolutely. Uh, You're in, man. <laughs> uh, uh, all right, Matt. Well, anyway, that's it for the Sales Influence Podcast. Please leave me some feedback on Stitcher, iTunes, YouTube, or wherever you find me. Also, check out Lee's website, Sales Architects, and that is with an S. Check out what he has to offer. Buy the book, buy the book, buy the book. If only for the differentiation universe piece, just buy the book. It's going to change how you position yourself with other companies. Also, check out the Sales Velocity Academy at salesvelocityacademy.com. And lastly, I want to thank you for listening. This is Victor Antonio, always reminding you, selling ain't hard when you hang out with Lee and Victor and you know how to sell. Take care. (laughs) 